Our virtual event today is what the 2020 election means to engineers. Russ Harrison, Director of Government Relations for IEEE USA, will discuss the results of the 2020 election, focusing on what it means for technology professionals and technology industries. He also will discuss the unique role engineers can play in setting technology policy. If you would like to post on Facebook about this event, please use the hashtags the HKN Experience and HKNX 2020. At this time, I'd like to hand it over to Nancy, Director of IEEE at Acapanu. Well, thank you, Stacey, and good afternoon, everyone. Well, good afternoon, wherever you happen to be in the world. Isn't it exciting the day after the election to have Russ Harrison with us from our partners at IEEE USA to discuss what the 2020 election means to engineers? And I know when we scheduled this, Russ, we said, well, we have to give you at least a little bit of time to try to digest what might have happened <laughs> and um, so that you can give us a little bit of love this night. But I, I've seen the slides, so I know we're up for a really great discussion. I know you want to hear from the audience, so please, if you, when you have a question, please type it into the chat because we'd love to see where you want to take this session as well. So we really invite you to participate and ask some questions. So that's over to you. So let us know, what does it mean? What's going on? I, I'm not entirely sure, actually, but we'll have to wait another couple of weeks to really know. Uh, yeah, it, we were expecting an exciting election, and that's what we got, uh, as we always do. Um, it is an honor to join you guys today. Get my earpiece right here. Uh, I'm Russ Harrison. I uh, said Director of Government Relations for IEEE USA in Washington, D.C., although I'm not in D.C. at the moment. Um, and what we want to talk about today is the election and kind of the big picture of what happened. Uh, but then start to focus on what does this mean for us, for technology professionals? Um, what's going to happen to our agenda in Washington? What, what happened to, to some of our allies? We got some exciting new members in Congress uh, with backgrounds that are intriguing. Uh, there'll be probably a couple more once the last uh, races are settled. Um, but this is your presentation. This is your group. Uh, so please do put any questions in the Q&A uh, box. We'll circle back to them later on. Uh, and if, you know, I say things you don't understand or that you want to challenge or you think are wrong, please, you know, go ahead and do so. And we can have a little discussion about what's up going on in, in, in the country. Um, I want to start just by noting a few things. Uh, first of all, it is obviously not over. Uh, I will be making a certain number of assumptions in this presentation about who's going to win, but if the numbers are still wobbling around and there are possibilities that there could be dramatic changes uh, in the list of winners before this is all said and done. Uh, so we don't know exactly what's happened, but we're starting to get a decent idea of what happened. Um, and a good amount of what I say, particularly when I talk about voting blocks and who voted for who and why and all that, a lot of that will change over the next couple of weeks and months. Uh, all the information we have on who's voted is mostly derived from exit polls. This is pollsters will send people to targeted precincts around the country, and they will ask people as they come out for voting, who did you vote for? Um, so that gives us some information on who voted for whom. The problem is exit polls are really bad. <laughs> They're all bad. Uh, and no one's figured out how to do it right. So we don't really have good information. That, however, will not stop me from drawing conclusions and saying things with a certain amount of authority about what just happened. I'm just telling you now, I don't actually know if it's true. That's okay. Uh, presidential update. Uh, there you go. I think most folks have seen this map. Some of the states have been colored in by some media sources, but I think this is a fairly good picture of where we are right now. Um, uh, Joe Biden has the lead, but he's kind of far away from winning. Uh, Donald Trump is a little bit behind him, but also not very close to winning. Um, the one change to this map that I think we definitely have to make is that Alaska is going to go for, for Donald Trump. Uh, so that's three in his column, uh, three electoral votes in his column. Uh, the problem with Alaska, well, is that it's Alaska and people are really far away from each other and it just takes forever to get the vote in. Uh, so Alaska usually comes in late, but there's no right now the Republicans are up two to one in the state, and that's probably how it's going to stay. So but that still gives us Georgia, which is a surprise, uh, North Carolina, which is not Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, which were expected to be the three big swing states, Arizona, which is a little bit of a surprise and Nevada, which is a little bit of a surprise uh, as the states that can still change. Now, 
given where the votes are and given where the vote tally is, it is likely at this point that Joe Biden will eventually become president. Uh, there are plausible scenarios where that doesn't happen, um, but that is the most likely outcome at this point. There's a saying in, in, well, a lot of things at this point that it's still early in the game, but it's better to be up one than down one. Uh, and at this point, whoever is in the lead is probably going to stay that way. Uh, having said that, Georgia and North Carolina are almost certainly going to go to Donald Trump, as is Pennsylvania, although Pennsylvania is a little squishier than it was a few hours ago. Uh, and if he wins those three states and one other one, he's going to become president. And that's possible. Now, he's losing all of the rest of them. But, you know, it is plausible. We're going to proceed as though Joe Biden has been elected president for the time being. So beyond the president's. Um, we have remarkably little change. Uh, in the Senate, the Democrats are going to gain between one and three Senate seats, but not control of the Senate. That is basically guaranteed at this point. That they will not control the Senate regardless of who wins the presidency. Uh, Republicans will gain somewhere between eight and 10, possibly 12 House seats, but not control of the chamber. Uh, that's a bit of a surprise. Most people expected Republicans to lose a handful, not win a handful of seats. Uh, the governorships, Republicans have picked up one governorship in Montana, which is, let's face it, not terribly surprising. It's a little surprising that there wasn't a Republican in the governor's seat, uh, governor's house in Montana. Uh, in the state legislatures, this is really the big surprise. We might have two legislatures that switch positions. The New Hampshire Senate may be captured by Republicans and the Arizona House may be captured by the Democrats. But that's it. Um, it looks right now that the fewest number of House, state House, not Congress, but the state House seats will shift parties in any year since 1994. And that was a remarkably low year, too. So the surprising thing about all this is given all the chaos of the last year, given all the nastiness in the political system, very, very little changed. I mean, we may get a new president, which is, of course, a big deal, but only by a sliver. Uh, and beyond the president, there's been remarkably little change. Uh, so the probable results, as I mentioned in Washington, is a Biden presidency and a split government, which is what we've had for you know the last 10 years or so. Uh, both parties will have narrower majorities in their two chambers. This probably means more for the Republicans in the Senate than the Democrats in the House. The, the House has always been, uh, it's the tyranny of the majority. In other words, m the minority party in the House does gets nothing. Uh, they can do nothing, they control nothing, they can yell and scream a lot, but they don't get to do a lot. Senate is still more collegial. The minority still has certain powers and certain rights. Uh, and so it matters more in the Senate, excuse me, it matters more in the House who's in the majority, even if it's only by one vote, than it does in the Senate. But still, we have deadlock. Uh, it is common in American history for the American people to split power between the two parties. Uh, it seems that like the American people don't trust either party, really. Uh, and so they make sure that both parties can keep an eye on the other one. And that is where we are again. If we look beyond the, the winners and looked at what happens underneath and again, this is all based on exit, as exit polls, which may prove to be wrong. But it looks like Donald Trump amazingly improved his voting margins among every subset that they look at of the population. African-Americans, Asians, Hispanics, women, except for white men. And it was white men that he did the least well with relative to 2016. He still won white men. He just didn't win by as much. Um, that may have cost him the election, which is quite interesting because that is not where people thought he had a problem. Um, Biden, for his part, did not do nearly as well in urban areas as was expected, but he seems to have made it up in the suburbs. He, of course, got destroyed in rural areas, but everybody thought that was going to happen. Um, the thing of it is, though, all of these little shifts are, in fact, tiny. There were, the, Donald Trump did six or seven points better among African-American men. Well, you know, that's a big shift relative to where he was, but seven points isn't all that much. Uh, Joe Biden did a little bit better among white men, but again, it was single digits shift. 
So we have a lot of little shifts throughout society, all of which will create a new president. But given the tiny margin that Donald Trump won the presidency the first time by, Joe Biden looks like he's going to win it by even smaller margin. If you look at the vote totals in the various states and certainly in the Electoral College, um, which, again, is kind of amazing. Now, the exception to this rule appears to be Hispanics. Hispanics appear to have moved rather significantly towards the Republicans. Didn't help Donald Trump necessarily, but it did help a lot of down ticket Republicans in a number of states. We're going to talk about a few of those in a minute, but just very quickly, the Republicans actually held a House seat on the southern border of Texas uh, that was drawn to be a Hispanic district to elect Democrats. They also picked up a House seat in southern New Mexico and two House seats in southern Florida. What's significant about this is the Hispanic community is not one thing. It's a bunch of different ethnic groups. Um, and within it, Cuban Americans, which make up a sizable percentage of the electorate in Florida, Cuban Americans are traditionally Republicans. And they've drifted towards the Democrats over the last couple of years. They seem to have come home to the Republican Party rather dramatically, which cost the Democrats two House seats in Miami. But the Republicans also did well among other Hispanics and Hispanics from Central America, uh, from South America, from Mexico, have been solid Democratic allies for a very long time. They still are, but not nearly as much as they were. So it looks at this point, the only really significant shift in the electorate uh, was among Hispanics, which is interesting. Uh, the problem for Donald Trump is that four of the states that he really wanted to win, Wisconsin, Minnesota, Michigan, and Pennsylvania, don't have very many Hispanic voters. And so that didn't actually help them, but it might, it could carry him to victory in Arizona. Uh, and if Donald Trump wins Arizona, there's a reasonably good chance he becomes president. Uh, and so Hispanics may ultimately end up saving his political life there. Uh, the bottom line here is that there's very little change overall from where we were in 2016, uh, but the small changes we did see may probably result in a new president. Okay. Any questions about the results in the Q&A? Okay. Now we get to the more interesting stuff. Oop. So... As of right now, we have no president. No one has been elected, or more accurately, we don't know who's been elected yet. Uh, as I think most of you know, the United States has a very complicated and kind of unusual system for selecting president. Uh, Joe Biden, by the way, has won the popular vote. That was never really in doubt. Uh, his margin in California was something like four and a half million votes, and that, that was that. But it doesn't matter, because we elect the president based on the Electoral College and there's a fairly complicated system in the Constitution for figuring out what the, uh, the, uh, the Electoral College says. So I want to quickly walk through what's going to happen next. Um, right now, let me back up. Each state gets to set its own rules for deciding how to select their electors to the Electoral Congress. That's not actually a federal law. Uh, for the first several decades of uh, the United States history, Many states actually had their state legislatures pick the electors. So there wasn't even a popular vote for president. That, of course, is no longer the case. But each state has kind of an idiosyncratic way of determining who the electors get to be. And that's what we're going through now. And so all of the lawsuits uh, about the various votes and what counts and what doesn't will be filed in state court. And if they go to the Supreme Court, the only thing that, you, that the litigants can argue is that the state either violated the law, their own state law, or that the state law violated some sort of federal equal protection laws. But they can't argue the state law are wrong because the Constitution gives the states pretty much carte blanche to set their own voting rules, as long as they don't discriminate and there are no poll taxes and some of those uh, nasty legacies of segregation. So the states are going through their process to choose their electors. Now, there will be a ton of lawsuits. A couple of them have already been filed. There will be more. The good news is all of that stops on December 8th. Under federal law, there is a safe harbor deadline on December 8th. And what that says is on December 8th, 
every single lawsuit about the, the determining who won the Electoral College goes away. And whoever is in the lead wins, which is actually kind of nice because we have a definitive end to this thing. You have a little over a month to fight it out, and then it just stops. Now, it's a federal law. It's not in the Constitution. So someone could challenge that in court. But that's a really tough legal hurdle to overcome. So most likely on December 8th, everything will stop. On December 14th, six days later, the electors will meet in their various state capitals to actually cast their votes for president. Uh, on December 23rd, Merry Christmas, everybody, uh, the governors of every state and the mayor of Washington, D.C., will file what's called a certificate of ascertainment with, uh, it actually goes to Mike Pence, the vice president, as well as the National Archives and a couple other places. Um, but that is a formal document where the state the governor declares what happened on election day. These guys won. These guys lost. These guys cast these votes for president, and those guys didn't. So it'll say, you know, Georgia casts 15 votes for most likely Donald Trump or Joe Biden. Uh, and those certificates are then passed on to the president of the Senate, who is the vice president, Mike Pence. January 3rd, the new Congress is sworn in. January 6th, the two chambers of Congress will meet in joint session to essentially certify the results of the election. What happens is the vice president will stand up in front of both houses of Congress and read or summarize each certificate of ascertainment. He will one by one announce how each state voted. At that point, any two legislators can object. It has to be at least one senator and one house member, but they can be from the same party. If two legislators object to the certificate of ascertainment, we say, no, 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 no. I know the governor of Pennsylvania said that Joe Biden won, but we think that Donald Trump actually won, and therefore those electors' votes should be cast. If they do that, very shortly thereafter, like the same day, if not immediately after the objections, both chambers of Congress have to vote on whether or not to accept the certificate of ascertainment from the governor. Both the Senate and the House have to both say, no, we don't accept the results for the results to be thrown out. But if they do, the results are thrown out and that state will not cast any electoral votes. If at the end of this process on January 6th, neither candidate gets to 270 electoral votes and it looks to me like the best Joe Biden can do is about 276 electoral votes, and the best Donald Trump can do is about 273 electoral votes. So we're really close on this. If neither candidate gets 270 electoral votes, everything that happened on November 3rd goes away. The popular vote, the electoral vote, the electors, all of it is done. And we essentially start over with a brand new process. That is done in the House of Representatives for president, but the House doesn't just vote. It's more complicated than that. What happens is each state, and I does not include the District of Columbia, so now we're just 50 votes. Each state casts one vote. So what happens is the 54 representatives from California will go off into a room and presumably vote for Joe Biden. They will then come back and cast one vote. The one representative from Wyoming will go off into a room by yourself, presumably, come back to the House and cast one vote for presumably Donald Trump. This, of course, gives a great deal of power to the smaller states. Now, we may object to that. You may say that's not fair. That's not democratic. But that is the process that we have had in place for 240 years. And that is how we are going to do it. At the moment, and a lot of, a lot of uh, races haven't been decided, so this could shift a little bit. At, but at the moment, it looks like the Republicans will control 26 states, should we come to this. And the Democrats control 24, and Pennsylvania, I don't know what's going to happen. But it doesn't matter, because if the Republicans get 26 votes, Donald Trump will become president. Now, of course, we cannot assume that every Republican in the House of Representatives will vote for Donald Trump, and therefore we can't be sure that every state will be cast based on the exact partisan makeup of the representatives. But that seems kind of likely. Um, the, the Senate picks the vice presidential candidate. 
That is a one senator, one vote vote. So that's just a straight up vote, which presumably means Mike Pence would be elected vice president. But it's possible that uh, Harris could be elected vice president by the Senate and Donald Trump elected by the House or that Joe Biden could be elected by the House and Mike Pence elected by the Senate, which would be entertaining. The bottom line here, though, is that on January 20th, we will have an inauguration and somebody will become president. If the House has been unable to reach 270 votes, because Canada, not to do, if the House has been unable to get 26 votes from the 26 of the states, so if the House has been unable to pick a president on January 20th, either Mike Pence will become president because he's the vice president only until the House can make a decision. Or if the Senate has successfully picked a vice president and for whatever reason picked Harris, Harris would become president until the House finishes picking someone. The point here is that no matter what happens in this process, on January 20th, we'll have a president. Yeah, oops, wrong button. Well, that is Which brings that us is all exciting, to the... exciting, right? No matter what. Yeah, no matter what, we'll have a president. So that's good news, because I know I've heard lots of other stories. So I think this is a great civics conversation. I know someone asked, um, is the vote of the majority? So it's interesting that it's one person, one vote. So that's, that's pretty clear. So it's not like you have to have two thirds to win. It's one. No, you just need a simple majority. Uh, and so whoever gets 26 of the states becomes president. And in the Senate, whoever gets 51 votes becomes Senate. Now there's, you could get a deadlock there, but let's face it. We don't need a vice president nearly as much as we need a president. So that's not quite as big a deal, but, and, and yeah, that's exactly the, the, the point here that, I think, gets lost in the noise of the political debate, which is we have a system. We actually have a very good system that has proven to be very durable and very robust and has worked really, really well. And it's going to work again this year, uh, which is why I bring up the election of 1824, something which I'm sure everybody is very familiar with. But just in case you've forgotten the details, uh, in that presidential election year, there were actually four candidates that got electoral votes. Andrew Jackson, uh, John Quincy Adams, William Crawford and Henry Clay. None of them got half of the electoral votes. None of them got half of the popular vote. Andrew Jackson came closest. He got the most votes, most popular votes, and the most electoral votes. However, uh, Henry Clay was the Speaker of the House at the time. And so when the Electoral College failed to select a president, it fell to the House, which was controlled by Henry Clay, who was the fourth place finisher for president. Henry Clay threw his support behind John Quincy Adams, who was promptly picked by the House of Representatives to become president. Shortly thereafter, John Quincy Adams picked Henry Clay to be his vice, not his vice president, his secretary of state. At the time, the assumption was the secretary of state was the position you wanted to be in if you wanted to become president down the line. So this act was seen as John Quincy Adams blessing uh, Henry Clay as his replacement. Now, you can see the rather profound conflict of interest there. Uh, Clay helped Quincy become president. Quincy Adams become president. Quincy Adams then helped Clay position himself to become president later on. Historians have argued whether there was a quid pro quo there. They do point out that John Quincy Adams was kind of ethical to a fault. So there is an argument that this was just Quincy Adams picking who he thought the best person for secretary of state would be. But the bottom line is, this happened in 1824, and John Quincy Adams became president. And we don't put an asterisk next to his name. We don't say he was sort of president. He was kind of president. He was the president. Uh, the conclusion of all this, by the way, is that four years later, Andrew Jackson became president. Um, so there was you know, some justice there for him. Um, if you're all interested in the details, there's three links there to some more detailed look at this. Some of the uh, uh, intricacies of this process are quite interesting if you're into this sort of thing. There's also a link to the National Association of Social Sciences that has a really good website uh, that has all the state laws on how each one of the states picks their own electors. And it's not the same. So if you're interested, there you go. All right. Any other questions about the procedure before we go on to this slide? Boop. Well, that was pretty exciting, but because I know, I know I've, I've heard that Nancy Pelosi becomes president, but that's not the case. 
No. Well, the I mean, the House Nancy Pelosi could president. become president if a certain number of people died. But other than that, no, she's not going to become president. <laughs> right. But I think I think the pundits have a lot of time to talk. They've got 24 hours of a news cycle to fill up. And there's a lot of talk. So this has been great. It's another civics review. Even if you didn't get that far in your civics class, it's been great. But I think, yeah, I'm really excited about the next part. I think we want to know what, what is that going to what's it going to mean? OK. Well, we before. Before we go into the next part, there is a question from the audience. On the previous slide, uh, the ability of a state's electoral college vote, is that vote majority two-thirds or unanimous? The electoral votes in the states? Oh, 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 yes. for, if Congress votes. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm with you. No, it's just a majority. It's a simple majority. Um, there's 54 representatives from California, which is what 27 is half. So you need 28 uh, votes to get the one vote from California. If a state deadlocks, and right now the the partisan makeup in Pennsylvania is split 10 and 10. If the two sides are not able to cast votes or to pick someone, that vote doesn't get cast. Uh, and so now there's a lot of uncertainty in Pennsylvania. It looks like a couple incumbents will lose, and so the when before we get to January 3rd, uh, the situation in Pennsylvania will probably have changed. But right now, if we had the vote, Pennsylvania would be split 10 to 10 uh, and would not be able to vote uh, for president down here on January 6th. But again, the founding fathers were actually very careful about what they did here, and they made an intentional choice to create a system that had to reach a decision because they felt we had to have a president, which contrasts sharply with how they set up Congress. Congress was actually set up so Congress couldn't reach decisions unless there was broad consensus, and that was deliberate. They deliberately created a system that was inefficient because they didn't want the government to be, ever, to be able to do very much. The Founding Fathers' primary concern was actually making sure that the, the, the government didn't re-enslave the people, and the way they went about preventing it was to make the federal government really inefficient at decision making. But for this part of the federal government, they made it very easy so that we would get a president at the very end. Uh, it's also worth noting that the election of 1824 is what the founders expected to happen most of the time. They actually thought the presidential election would usually be decided in the House. So far, it's only happened once. Okay. So the 116th Congress is not over until January 3rd, technically the minute the first new representatives swear themselves in to start the, 200, uh, the 117th Congress. So we have a lot of stuff to get done before the end of the year. Based on the election returns uh, from, last, from earlier this week, the key legislative strategy of Congress is to get out. And really that's all they're going to be doing. Um, the fact is, because the partisan makeup of Congress hasn't shifted, because nobody took over anybody else's chamber, there's no particular reason to prolong these fights. So Congress is going to get done the minimal amount it needs to get done, and then they're just going to go home for Christmas because they're all tired. Uh, what that means is there's a couple things that are going to pass. Uh, the NDAA, National Defense Authorization Act, will pass, which is a big deal because there are a number of provisions in that bill that will help out engineers, including language promoting artificial intelligence research, quantum computing, re well, quantum research beyond quantum computers, 5G deployment, and a few other things that we care about. Uh, so that bill is going to pass, um, which is which is good. There's a number of provisions that IEEE had been fighting for. Um, we got, as I said, uh, AI, quantum, 5G. We did not get addition. doesn't look like, not done yet, but it doesn't look like we're going to get additional funds for research. The Endless Frontiers Act, which we'll talk about in a minute. Uh, the CHIPS Act, which is a bill to promote semiconductor manufacturing in the United States. So those probably won't be included. But the NDAA will, NDAA will pass, uh, and there will be provisions in that that will be very helpful to engineers in the United States. Uh, then Congress will turn to the fiscal 2021 budget which they were supposed to pass in September and didn't. Uh, the thinking right now is that they're just going to basically pass a simplified version in early December and then go home, and that'll be it. We do not, at the moment, expect any real changes in the funding levels for our programs. There will probably be, in the end, some small shifts here and there, but really not much. 
Now, the other bill that might get taken up by the end of the year is a COVID relief bill. Uh, Senator McConnell, who will return as the uh, Senate Majority Leader, has said that he would like to do a COVID bill before they go home. The problem is the two parties, both parties want to do it. Both parties say it's a priority, and that means they probably won't get done. Uh, the two parties disagree dramatically in some of the pieces of what that bill would look like. And unfortunately, they're the big parts of the bill. Uh, and so it's possible we could get a little COVID relief bill, um, but it's looking unlikely that we'll get a particularly big one. But you never know. Maybe they're in a cooperative mood once uh, the presidential election is settled. Uh, they come back, pass something quick, and then go home. Excuse me. So starting to look at what we're going to see for next year in next year's Congress, there's a couple really bright spots for engineers uh, and technical professionals more generally. Um, there is, and it, this is a bit of a surprise, over the last six months, we've seen an emerging consensus from both political parties that the United States needs to dramatically increase the amount of money it spends on technology research. This push to get research overall increased, but technology research is on the fast track. And we have a number of bills like the Endless uh, Frontier Act, which is a bill that would allocate 100 billion new dollars for technology research over the next five years, which is a lot. It would also reorient the federal research system to focus more on technology and less on the sciences. Um, except for the health sciences. Health sciences always get more money. Uh, then we have the Foundries Act and the CHIPS Act, which provide financial incentives to bring technology manufacturing back into the United States. Uh, all three of these bills are bipartisan. Um, the Endless Frontier Act and the CHIPS Act have sponsors in both houses of Congress. Uh, and we know that the Endless Frontier Act will be a priority next year, and I expect the other two will as well. Um, there will also be a big push this year and next year for university relief because of COVID. Uh, the universities, I'm sure many of you know, have been absolutely pounded by COVID. Uh, their finances have been totally messed up in a lot of different ways. The universities went to Congress to ask for relief, much like what the airlines got, and they didn't get a particularly warm welcome. But they did get a warm welcome for the idea that they needed more money for research because of expenses associated with COVID from shutting down and then later on revving back up various types of research. Uh, and so there is a chance that we could get a big chunk of money for university research uh, in either the COVID relief bill or a bill earlier next year. Uh, but overall, this is something that IEEE USA will be prioritizing next year and where we think we can actually make do some good work and get some actual legislation, regardless of who is president. Uh, a little bit about immigration and visa policy. This is, this is interesting. Um, depending on who's president, the policy will be diametrically different, but the result probably won't. Um, IEEE, just to go into the details here really quickly, we believe that it is in America's interest and America's workers' interest that we allow skilled workers to come into the United States to work and live. However, how we do that matters enormously. IEEE USA believes that it needs to be based on citizenship. That is, if we're going to add skilled workers to our economy, which we should, we should do it as citizens, not just temporary workers. And so we are strong supporters of a system for allowing international graduate students at American universities who get a degree in a STEM field to move, be, to have a path to move from student visa to a green card within one year without having to worry about any other visas. Once you get a green card, five years later, you can become a full citizen. And green card holders are more or less able to behave like American citizens. You know, they can move, they can change jobs, they can go back to school, they can do normal stuff. Um, so that is we so we support green cards. We do not support H-1B visas and other temporary workers, primarily because they are not green cards. Uh, H-1B workers don't own their visa. 
Uh, the visa is actually owned by their company, so they don't have the legal right to change jobs easily. They can't quit. They can't go back to school. They can't drop out of the workforce to start a family. You know, they can't do they don't have the choices that Americans and other people with green cards have in this country. As a result, they're very easy to exploit. And while many companies use the H-1B responsibly, many others don't. Um, the, the bigger problem here, though, is that most H-1B workers are never able to become Americans because the decision on whether or not to let them become an American rests with their employer, not with the individual. And that's really just not healthy. So IEEE-USA opposes the H-1B program. We're not trying to get rid of it, but we want to reform it. We oppose the H-1B, but we, ex we support the green card expansion to let skilled foreign nationals become American citizens. So what happens with policy? Well, the Trump administration has been very good on H-1Bs. Uh, they've in, in put in place a number of good reforms, including one just last week, which isn't in place yet. They're putting it in place uh, on how H-1B visas are allocated that we think is quite good. But Donald Trump has been particularly bad on green cards. Excuse me. He's also been particularly bad on student visas, which we support. Uh, and so good on one, bad on the other. A Biden administration is likely to be exactly the opposite. Uh, the Biden camp has made some very positive, made some very positive statements regarding H-1B visas in the last couple of months, which we find disturbing. But they've also made some very good statements on green cards that we find very encouraging. Uh, and so we see the positions will be exactly flipped and we will agree and disagree with whoever is president, but for exactly opposite reasons, which is kind of a position to be in, but that's where we are. The bottom line on this, however, is that we've been trying to get real immigration reform in this country for well over 20 years now. I've been doing this for 18, almost 19 years, and we've failed spectacularly as a country to do anything about this. And it is unlikely that the new partisan makeup in Congress will make a difference. Overall, the Republican Party is not interested in increasing immigration very much, although they're willing to talk about reforms within the program to make it work better. Democrats are unfortunately not particularly interested in working on reforming the system unless we can increase immigration. And that's where we've been since more or less 1998. Uh, and it is likely where we will be again next year. Having said all that, IEEE-USA's basic proposal to make it easier for international students, international STEM students, with a master's or PhD to become an American citizen in some sort of accelerated way actually is very broad bipartisan support. Uh, we have, if we could get a bill to the floor, it would probably pass both the House and the Senate. We actually did get a bill to the floor in 2012 and it passed the House with overwhelming Republican support. It would have passed in the Senate, except that the Democrats wanted to do comprehensive reform and so they didn't bring it up for a vote. And the next year we tried to do comprehensive and it failed. The point is a relatively targeted bill to help high skill immigrants become American citizens has a path to passage in Congress and with either administration. There are some major hurdles to overcome, most of which are purely political, um, but there is a way to get it done. And so we are cautiously optimistic is probably too positive a spin on this, but we do see a way to move forward on this in a way reform is possible although probably not likely. Um, an issue which is, has come up um, recently, uh, which is uh, contracting rules. This, this, this impacts any technology professional that's thinking of becoming a consultant, uh, thinking of opening you know, their own business uh, as a sole proprietor, um, and which includes you know, a good percentage of IEEE members around the country. There are two notably different systems for determining if someone is a contractor or an employee, um, one of which is AB5, which is a bill out in California, a law out in California, uh, that's the Uber Lyft rule that has come up in the press quite a bit. Um, as originally written, AB5 almost made it illegal to be a contractor, a technology contractor in California, which would have been kind of unfortunate for Silicon Valley. They have since amended the law to make it possible. It is still not, we're not real thrilled with the law. Um, by the way, the referendum that uh, helped out Lyft and Uber 
uh, in California that passed Proposition 22 does not affect our members. It's very narrowly tailored just to help the uh, the, the gig uh, car companies. So you have the AB5 and the PRO Act, which is a national bill that would take AB5 and make it a national law that we're not particularly fond of. There's a second rule that the Department of Labor put out a couple of weeks ago. Uh, on It's called the economic reality test. And this is kind of the traditional way of determining if someone is an employee or a contractor. Um, it is a simpler rule and it works better for technologists, uh, although it is not perfect either. Um, the point here, though, is that there's likely to be a very big debate about this next week, uh, next year, rather. And there's no real path forward for either reform at the national level. Uh, Republicans in the Senate will block the PRO Act. Re Democrats in the House will block any legislation uh, enshrining the economic reality test into law. And so I don't know quite how this moves. Uh, but IEEUSA will be working next year to educate legislators about the unique impact these laws will have on technology consultants and to make sure that there is a protection in whatever ends up moving uh, for technologists who want to be consultants. All right. The one other big issue that we're, we, we see opportunity for next year is space policy. Um, there's been some really exciting stuff going on in space. Uh, you have private space flights, uh, private space companies starting to do really well and starting to you know, actually make money and to become real players uh, in the space business. Of course, during the Trump administration, we also had the creation of Space Force. We had the Artemis plan, which was is President Trump's plan uh, for bringing a woman and presumably some other people uh, to the moon before 2024. Uh, and then to start the work on getting us to Mars, getting actual people to Mars, although there's no real target date for that. Um, if Donald Trump is reelected, which is possible, uh, those will continue. Uh, we are IEEE doesn't have a position on Space Force, but we're supportive of the Artemis plan. But here's the thing. If Joe Biden becomes president, which is also possible, um, Space Force is not going to go away. It will cease, it'll stop being a standalone branch of the United States military and will be moved back into the Air Force, which is where it was before. The Space Force is so closely identified with President Trump that a President Biden would want to essentially take Trump's name off of it. And you do that by putting it back in the Air Force. The so Space Force goes away. They'll call it something else. Same thing with the Artemis plan. Artemis plan is a it's, it's a very pretty plan. It's a great name. Uh, and it is closely associated with Donald Trump, which means Joe Biden is going to get rid of it. But he's going to get rid of the name. He's not necessarily going to get rid of the plan. The thing of it is, Artemis is on track to put a woman on the moon before the end of a Biden presidency, even if he only serves one term, which he probably will. Well, what president wouldn't want that? That's the coolest thing you could ever possibly do as president is put a person on the moon, or in this case, the first woman on the moon. So I seriously doubt Joe Biden will, will abandon the objective. He's just going to change the name. Similarly, the biggest development in space is the emergence of private space companies, which gives the United States a tremendous edge in this field internationally. Uh, that actually started in the Obama administration, <clears throat> technically started in the Bush administration, but Obama really got it going. <clears throat> excuse me. And President Trump just picked it up and ran with it. But the, the basic policy to promote, to encourage, to allow private companies to participate in space has been U.S. policy for quite a long time. And I don't see Joe Biden changing that should he become president. So space policy is an exciting area that doesn't get a lot of attention. But under the radar, it, it, we're seeing some real bipartisan progress in that cutting edge technology, which is quite exciting. So as we look at all the chaos in Washington and in the country at the moment, it's important to notice that there are areas where there's still cooperation. Uh, and in the long run, those areas of cooperation matter a lot to the, the future success of the country. And that was a lot of information. Yep. And so I was going to say... Yeah, I don't know if there were any questions. 
Um, you know, it's funny. We had, a, we had a speaker on yesterday from NASA, and they talked, they talked a lot about what's going on in space. Really cool presentation. Mm. So if you haven't, didn't catch that, catch that on demand. Um, but he did also, and I know yesterday or the day before was the 20th anniversary of the space station, International Space Station, mm-hmm. which I had heard too. Um, and we did talk a little bit about how they wanted to make that kind of into an International Space Station hotel. So that there's an opportunity for that with the private space travel and private space. So, so a lot of cool <clears> stuff <throat> and a lot of other uh, things happening. So anything else with space? Because I guess space has advanced research so much. Um, yeah. Do you see? Do you see any? You know, again, so not just investing in um, these particular plants, but investing in research, investing in space. Kinds of it kind of seems to put our, our research track um, on hyper. You know, light speed, if you will. Yeah, what's exciting about the private sector getting involved is the private sector can be, you know, more reckless than the government can be. And, and I don't mean that in a bad way. They, they're they better at taking risks. They're better at trying kind of just ludicrous things like putting a hotel at the International Space Station. I mean, the government is never going to do that. But Elon Musk might. And it might work. Uh, and, you know, the... Private companies have already shown they can put people and put satellites in space much more cheaply than the governments can. <clears throat> they are trying some very innovative, exciting things. There's a there's an actual plan to start mining asteroids in the next couple of years, and that that's huge. There is trillions of dollars of wealth sitting in asteroids, and if we can figure out a way to get it and get it back to Earth profitably... First of all, we can stop mining on Earth, which would be a good thing. Uh, and second of all, it, it's an enormous economic boom for whoever can do it. And at the moment, the United States is best placed to do it. And so that that's kind of a big deal. Um, so, yeah, I get very excited about where we're going in space. And when I get depressed about some of the other things going on in Washington, that's what I think about. <laughs> well, it's good to have just some place to go. Just some place to go. You kind of being down in, that, in, in the beltway, you, you do need some place. Um, we had two of our eminent members on earlier in the week. One was Len Kleinrock, one of the fathers of the Internet. We also had Bob Metcalf on. So they talked to us a little bit about where they're seeing technology going. You know, and Len mentioned CRISPR, quantum, and blockchain, bioengineering, and neural networks. Do you see um, a lot of interest in Congress? I mean, you talked about research, about any of these particular kinds of technologies, or uh, I know IEEE in Future Directions was working hard on some of these areas. Um, or is it just general? You mentioned quantum a little bit. Um, you no, know, there's there's a lot of specific technology that Congress is very excited about. Quantum is one of them. A um, <clears throat> little aside on quantum, one of the things that IEEE USA spends a lot of time doing is simply putting engineers in front of legislators in kind of quiet talks that allow legislators, or more accurately, their staff, to ask stupid questions, which is important because, you know, most congressional staff, most members of Congress are not engineers they're not scientists but they have to understand this stuff to enact good policies so anyway we were called by um uh a member of congress uh actually his chief of staff and chief of staff said my boss thinks quantum is the next big thing he thinks it's absolutely essential that the united states maintain a lead internationally on this research and that it is crucial for the national security of the united states that we dominate in the quantum computing space and he has empowered me his chief of staff to come up with legislation to make sure all of that happens and we said great you should do that and then she said which would be lovely but i don't know what a quantum computer is and we said we can fix that and so we found four or five ieee members who are involved in quantum research brought them into Washington, D.C., which tragically we can no longer do. Uh, We brought them into Washington, D.C., and we sat down in a back office in one of the House office buildings with the chief of staff and two other staffers that were curious, and they just asked all the questions about what is quantum, what does it mean, what does it do, is it going to work? And they had a really, really in-depth conversation about it and left understanding the technology. Uh, So quantum computing is one area that's a big deal. Um, Broadband is almost certainly going to get uh, money next year from the federal government to do broadband deployment to poorer areas and rural areas of the country. Uh, One of the things that, um, well, COVID has demonstrated for everybody is that internet connectivity is kind of a big deal. I know, uh, I assume most people that are listening in are trapped somewhere, either in a dorm room or at home. That is 
at least for me, it's it's difficult sometimes. It's isolating. But can you imagine what it would be like if we didn't have the internet and you just couldn't talk to people? Um, the problem is parts of rural America. That's true. Parts, you know, the poorer parts of our country. That's still true. Um, we've also found out that <clears throat> college campuses and national labs tend to have really, really good internet con connectivity, um, generally the best you can get. What we found is that when you get right off of college campus and right out of the national labs, it can drop off dramatically because a lot of universities and national labs are in rural parts of the country that don't have good broadband. And thus, when professors and researchers were told to go home because of COVID, they suddenly found they couldn't do their work because they couldn't get good enough internet. So there's going to be a rollout of internet. AI mm -hmm. is a big deal. Uh, Congress mm -hmm. is very concerned about that. That's looking more not how do we develop the technology, but how do we integrate it into society? Um, you had mentioned a couple other things. CRISPR gets a lot of people nervous, although I don't know if they're going to do anything about it. Uh, you get in, in digital privacy is kind of the same issue. Um, Congress is worried about digital privacy. There's likely to be a push next year to rein in the tech giants. Um, to, to be blunt about it, some of the decisions made by some of the tech companies in this election cycle are almost absolutely guaranteed to get a response by Congress that they're not going to like next year. Um, <clears throat> the big that's tech no companies have... That's no matter who's president, right? No matter who's president, you see that happening. So that's not that's not a party issue. That's going to be happening either way. Well, what's interesting about it, though, is that the big tech companies have successfully pissed off both parties, but they've pissed them off in entirely different ways. And so there will be an attempt to do it. It is not yet clear to me that the two parties can coordinate enough to channel their anger at the tech companies to produce actual legislation um, because they both want different things. Uh, so I think both parties are going to want to rein in the tech companies. It's The only question is, can they get their act together enough to do it? And that is not clear. Um, and you had mentioned a couple other technologies, which I've now forgotten. Uh, blockchain, um, bioinformatics, yeah. neural networks. Um, blockchain is an interesting technology. Uh, Congress took a hard look at it a few years ago. And uh, so in Washington, the only thing people in Washington do is talk. That, that's all we produce. And we produce solutions to various policy problems. Um, some people have very successful careers with just one solution to everything. Uh, and they, you know, all, all we need to do is raise taxes or all we need to do is cut taxes. And that's how we fix any potential problem you can have. Well, there was a brief moment in time a few years ago when the answer was blockchain. Didn't matter what the question was. That was the answer. Uh, and for example, one of the solutions that people came up with on Capitol Hill was we, the United States has a problem in that we don't have a national ID card or a national ID number. We have social security numbers which it's actually illegal to use that number for any purpose other than Social Security, although everybody does it. Um, but that's really insecure. You know, it's just a number. There's no security around it. So there's a real need to develop some other way of identifying people in a secure and accurate way, particularly online. Um, and somebody came up with the idea of using blockchain. We give every American citizen their own blockchain. Every time you use it, you get a new link on the chain. It's unbreakable. It's totally unique and it works great online. So we should do that. Um, IEEE thinks blockchain is a cool technology. It's a great technology. But we went up to Congress and we said, look, you can do this if you want. And there are some advantages to doing it. But you should under two th understand two things about blockchain. One, it's not unhackable. It just hasn't been hacked yet. Two, if you want to give every American citizen a blockchain, you have to double the amount of energy the United States produces because that's enormously energy intensive. Now, that is actually no longer true. This was a couple of years ago. Blockchain has actually become more efficient, but it is true that it requires a lot of energy. Um, there is some interest on that behalf of Congress to do something about cryptocurrencies, although they've been around for a while and really haven't caused a lot of problems. So the interest in that has kind of dropped off. Um, but blockchains themselves are still being kicked around as, as a, just kind of a cool technology that solves a bunch of problems. People are just trying to figure out which ones they are. Right, because again, I know people listening might think, um, even if they're students, 
uh, where are those areas? Where are the really uh, rich areas for me to be looking at in my studies? Maybe if I'm looking at career choices, companies that I want to look at, how would you maybe give advice to those who are current students or graduate students looking to go out into the workforce or just staying in university looking at what am I, what should my PhD be on? Um, where, where should I uh, sort of direct that study? Because again, it will be funded or there'll be a lot of interest in it or, you know, impactful. Uh, for our country, legislatively and otherwise? Uh, well, first of all, I should point out that I am not an engineer. Um, uh, a good chunk of my family are engineers, but I am not. And thus, if you're looking for career advice, I am not the best place to look. Having said that, um, I do think, at least in the short run, uh, and by which I mean the next two or three or four years, there's going to be a lot more federal money put behind technology research. Um, all the th AI, quantum, uh, materials research, computers research, aeronautics, um, any anything associated with defense is likely to get a bunch of new money, regardless of which administration we're talking about. Um, you know, we're big money. So if you're interested in research, engineering technology research is likely to get a bunch of new money soon, um, I mean, soon being next year, probably. Beyond that, I, I am not particularly skilled at telling you which fields within the economy to go into. Um, from my perspective, they're all pretty exciting. And frankly, if you're a random American, doing what you're doing is probably the best possible choice for getting a job, regardless of what field you go into. Uh, that's fair um, enough, oh, oh, fair that was, We brought you your expertise in those other areas. Well, ahead. one other thing I should mention, though, which I almost forgot about, which is something that engineers never ever think about, is the policy world for jobs. Um, every government, every government agency has policy experts that focus on technology. Um, you know, the obvious ones, Defense Department has a ton of technology experts. Uh, Commerce, Labor have technology experts, but, you know, even some of the other agencies have them. Local governments, state governments need people to tell them how to use technology, how to integrate technology into their services, how to help integrate technology into society. Uh, so there's an awful lot of opportunities in the policy world for people with technology backgrounds. I will just make a quick pitch for the IEEE Fellows Program, uh, which those of you who have PhDs or about to get PhDs, this would be something you might want to look at. And those of you who haven't, this might be something to look at down the line, where we hire IEEE members for a year and place them on Capitol Hill as a full-time staff member for a member of Congress or place them in the State Department uh, as a full-time State Department employee. Uh, we Our members generally find that they're one year on Capitol Hill. They learn more than they learned in four or eight years in college, and it is a life-changing experience. Those of you who don't have PhDs who are interested in working on Capitol Hill, we have successfully helped a number of IEEE members transition into a more political job. Uh, and I can tell you, the IEEE members that have gone to Capitol Hill have found themselves to be sought after um, by by whomever their, you know, their office, their allies, there's just not enough people on Capitol Hill who really understand technology for Congress to pass the laws they have to pass. And so when somebody shows up who knows what they're talking about, they become invaluable to people on Capitol Hill. So there's a lot of interesting opportunities in the policy space for people with engineering backgrounds. I will warn you, however, if you dabble in this space, you're likely to ruin your life because all of you have bright <laughs> futures with, with great careers planned, and this will mess it up, and your parents will never forgive you. On the other hand, you well, can end up doing is, some really rewarding things. Well, Sorry. Yeah, you can. The other way to change the world, right, is, is through that. Yeah. Policy does affect all of us. I think that's true. And you have the WISE program, too, which we didn't get a chance to talk about. So that's another great way to get dabble there. Um, if you want to say something yeah. about the WISE program. I actually didn't bring up the WISE program specifically because we don't know if we're going to have it this year. Uh, because oh, of COVID, so we weren't Sorry able to bring that. in our interns. Right. Yeah. No, no, it's okay. Because yeah. it's a that's, great program, that's usually. A great program. That's yeah. a great program. It'll come well, back eventually. Does, yeah, you guys do a lot of great stuff. I only know one congressman on Con I'm one congressman who is um, who's a scientist, and he's the Eta Kappa new member, Congressman Cardenas, out in California. So we inducted him. He wanted to get uh, become Eta Kappa new when he was at University of California, San Diego, uh, Santa Barbara, I'm sorry. Um, but we are, um, I know that there need, need to be more people in Congress that understand these, um, 
these these areas, technology, the sciences, other mm-hmm. kinds of things like this. So I think what you've mentioned is really great advice. Any final thoughts for us as we, we wrap up now for today? Well, I'm going to follow up on what you just said. There are actually at least two more technology people that have been elected to Congress, and there will probably be a few more. Uh, Senator Kelly, who probably has been elected to the Senate from Arizona, is a former astronaut and an aeronautical engineer. And Congressman Gonzalez, who was elected in southern Texas, uh, was a DOD cryptologist, uh, which is not exactly an engineer, but it's close enough for our taste. Uh, And so we have seen over the last 10, 15 years Uh, more and more people with unusual backgrounds and scientific backgrounds and engineering backgrounds find their way into Congress. Uh, There are a couple. uh, Congressman Massey uh, from Kentucky uh, is an MIT graduate with a degree in mechanical engineering, uh, uh, computer engineering, excuse me, who started a software company before getting into Congress. Uh, Daniel Webster, a congressman from Florida, is an EE. Uh, And there's there's several others. McClintock is is one, uh, West Virginia, who I'm completely forgetting his name, is a professional engineer. Uh, So there are actually a decent number of them, and more and more every year, which is exciting. Uh, So I'll just finish up by saying it is an honor to join all of you guys. I always love working with Etta Kappa Nu, which is a fantastic organization. Uh, I hope that I will be able to join you in person at some point down the line. Uh, But my name, Russ Ireson, my phone number is 202-530-8326. My email address is r.t.harrison at ieee.org. Uh, it is a distinct honor to represent all of you in Washington, D.C. Uh, it is a pleasure to work with you and for you. And so if I can be of service to you at any time, please reach out. Uh, that That is what we're there for. So thank, thank you. Thank you so much. And, and IEEE USA does a great job, and we're really um, happy to have them. They really uh, represent us well. Um, and thanks so much. And thank IEEE USA for sponsoring this session today. They've been a sponsor of our HP experience, and we appreciate that.